Thank you for joining us at VC2, where we are real people meeting real needs with the reality of Christ. If you have a testimony or any questions, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter as VC2 Online. You can also find out more about us, notes from each message, and a way to give at live.vc2online.com. We'd also love for you to stay up to date with what's going on here at VC2 by downloading the VC2 app. You can find it wherever you get your apps from. Torrent Conference is a gathering of believers from across the United States, all coming together for one purpose, to be refreshed, revitalized, and refilled with the plan and purpose of God. In session one, we're hearing from Mark Wargo, who pastors Cross Current Church in Port Huron, Michigan. Mark is the author of the book Beyond Betrayal. So here's session one of Torrent 2018. Man, it is so good to be back with family. You guys are absolutely awesome. If you don't know me, and you don't like me afterwards, that would be Pastor Chad's fault, and we'll blame him. Um, you know, so a couple weeks ago back home, we had this uh, weather that we don't normally get in Michigan, especially at this time of year. It was actually 83 degrees, <clears throat> and I thought, man, this is kind of like preparing me for Georgia. <clears throat> I get here, it didn't prepare me at all. Hot is hot. Hades is Hades, man. It is just seriously not right. That's just hot. <clears throat> Marlene and I are like trying to get from one air conditioning place to the next air conditioning place. It's like, this ain't even right, man. So I don't know how you all do it, but you do. If it was this hot and I lived down here, you'd be seeing me in really short shorts and a tank top every Sunday. <clears throat> I'd be like... <laughs> I believe this is one of those churches, come as you are, and that's how I would be. Right? That's how I would be. <clears throat> but I am really, really honored. My wife, my wife Tracy sends her hello and her love to the, C, or the VC2 family, and, and uh, she wishes she could be here, but we've got her doing a lot of stuff back home, and so, uh, but she sends her love. I, 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 my prayer is that over the next couple of days that I say something that makes sense, and I say something that really ministers to you personally, and something is said that, that really um, helps your pastors, and comes alongside, because um, the best is yet to come for this church. Now I can get up, and I can hype you up, and I can, we can do all that. We can swing from the chandeliers. I don't mind doing that. Hopefully, they're anchored well. <clears throat> but I believe, I'm, I'm, with all of my heart, man, the best is yet to come. And so this whole idea of the legacy of hope Man, I've just mulled this over since I heard it for several, several months. And, you know, a while ago, I <clears throat> preached this message to our church. And when I got done, the Lord said, this is for VC2 as well. I said, all right, well, let me go back and let me look at it. Let me just kind of figure out what you're saying here. And, and I believe that he has uh, given me some things for, for y'all. So if you would just connect, you know, with your hearts, connect with your heart of faith, connect with that prophetic side, if you, if you have that particular bent, protect or connect at a deeper level. I'm just asking you today just to kind of allow yourself to just go from seeing this to seeing this a little bit. You don't have to be a visionary to have vision, right? You say, well, he's a visionary. He ought to have vision. No, you don't have to have, you don't have to be a labeled visionary. You just got to have a heart for what God wants. And so I'll start out. We'll just start out and have a little fun. Is that okay? <clears throat> because one of the things the Lord spoke to me is that if, if we, he spoke this to me back home, he, he spoke this as I was preparing for this conference, and he said, if my people refuse to move with me, they will become another museum. And I think about this, and I think about individuals who have, right, they become, they, they forget, they refuse to move with God and what he's asking them to do. And they don't realize it, but they've become a, become a museum because all their stories are about past moves of God. All their stories about what used to be, what it used to be, and how exciting it was in the 70s for the faith and the healing movement in the 80s. And my God was so strong. And, and we don't realize that people who move with God are still open for business because God's moving today. Nothing wrong with stories of the past, but some of the stories in the past are pretty jacked up, if you know what I mean, man. 
The first time the church woke up to the things of the Spirit, there was a demon behind everything. Right? Yeah. Right? Don't touch this. Don't do that. And so what I'm saying today is we've got to be open. Can we be open just a little bit to move with God? Yeah. I'm not talking about looking for the movement when God cracks the sky and Jesus comes back. That's all going to be awesome. But I want to be busy doing what he's called me to do when he comes back and when he returns. Is that okay? And so I want to take you to Genesis chapter 26. Can we go there? Let's go to Genesis chapter 26. And we're just going to hang here. We're going to talk about uh, the idea of Isaac digging these wells. And I think there's some truths that can help us out. I think there's some truths that can help you out personally. And truths that can help you um, continue to move us forward as a church. A to the men. All righty then. Legacy. Legacy is simply a, a gift by will, especially, you know, kind of like money or personal property. But how many of you know that we are called to leave a legacy that is not just money? Right? right. right. It's not just, you know, something physical, although there are parts to that that God has asked us to leave. And so the title of this conference is Legacy of Hope. And the idea of us being people of God that are willing to leave a gift of hope. I talk to the people back home sometimes, and I'm like, if this is your last week, what are you going to leave behind? If this is your last year here on this earth, what are you going to leave behind? Because there's a difference between being a person of legacy and being a legend. Legend is about you. Right? I don't want to be a legend. I don't want to be, I don't care to be known by man. I mean, when I was younger, I did. When I was immature, I thought, you know, I'm going to, I want to go out and do this because I was the white rapper and I had big, boofy hair and I was ready to roll and I wanted to go out and I wanted to, I wanted to reach the world for Jesus, but it was more about the heart of being a legend. I didn't realize it then, but when I look back, it was like more about the heart of being a legend. And as you grow up and you mature a little bit, you realize, I don't want to be a legend. I want to leave a legacy. And so this idea of legacy, you, you know, and I think about this often. Have you ever noticed that the idea of having something is a lot different than the reality of when it shows up? Yes. For instance, when you don't have any kids and you're saying, I can't wait to have a child. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the idea of having kids is a whole heck of a lot different than when they show up and keep you up all night, pooping and peeing and screaming and getting your, all, your schedule all out of whack. So the idea is a lot different. The idea of a church growing and reaching lost people, A-O, is a whole heck of a lot different than when they start showing up and take your seat. We literally had a pastor on staff come to staff meeting, all, I don't want to say the P word, but all ticked off. <laughs> all ticked off because somebody sat in his seat. He's no longer on staff with us. <laughs> He's now overseeing his old church so he can have the big throne on the platform. Ayo. <laughs> See, the idea of having things, the idea of having a nice big house is so great until you got to maintain it. The idea of being called by God and doing something wonderful for the kingdom and advancing is a lot better than actually getting down into the trenches and getting your hands dirty. To make that thing happen. God, you're like, God, I didn't know this was going to be work. I thought it was just going to be prayer and fasting. The idea of reaching somebody at work that hates you. I'll just break it down to everyday terms here. That gossips about you. That really offends you by calling you a Jesus freak. The idea of reaching them is really great until you got to get into their lives and forgive them over and over and over and show the love of Christ in ways you never knew you had. 
The idea of something is a lot better for us till the reality of it shows up. And today at this church, there is a transition. You've already been in it, but there's a transition from going to the idea of something to the reality of it. The idea of something to the reality of something. And the reality is that it's going to require all of us to get our hands dirty. It's going to require all of us to get our hands dirty. It's going to require all of us to get our hands calloused. During worship, I was pulling these calluses off. The reason is because the idea back home that we, you know, prayed for and fasted for and we went to court over and had to struggle for several years and gaining this extra square feet and it was stolen from us three times and the, the, the guy kept taking us to court and see the idea was a lot different than the reality of now we're in it and as a senior pastor having to be the general contractor and help build the walls and put the mud up and Mar Pastor Marlene and I were talking about this and I remember one time I was working and I was like complaining a little bit to the Lord I was like, what senior pastor has to be the general contractor? And the Lord says, what, gen what senior pastor gets to? Uh, yeah. I was like, all right, I'll learn to do drywall mud then. <laughs> I was able to, we are going to this place and, you know, and no longer complaining after that moment, but I realized something at a greater level, that reality, when it shows up, requires hands to get dirty, knuckles to get bloody, calluses to show up, but that's when the heart shows up. You know this, our fairness issues? This wasn't in the brochure. I could give you a list a mile long. I'm sure the pastors can too. This wasn't in the brochure when you called me. Bible college, they say, put your, put your uh, you know, brochure together and just mail it out. Well, none of this stuff of being betrayed and backstabbed and people leaving the wall after being so excited about the move of God. When reality shows up, they leave. None of that stuff was in the brochure. So let's go in the Bible. Genesis chapter 26, verse 12, it says, Isaac... You know, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? Those guys, this is the middle one. <laughs> Isaac, it says Isaac, verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. Remember that phrase right there, because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. He had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You have become too powerful for us. I just want to put something in front of you, that when reality shows up and God begins to bring the promise that he's given you as a church as it's begun already, and he's begun to begin to bring the promise in your life personally, just know this, not everybody is going to celebrate. Not everybody's going to be excited. Not everybody's going to jump up and down and go, yay, you got your breakthrough. They may say it at the door and say, bless you, brother. But in their mind, they're saying, screw you, man. I've been praying for eight years and nothing had come my way. That's right. That's right. Did I just say that at church? <laughs> we can edit, right? Just remember who that pastor is. Okay, you're good. Your pastor said worse. <laughs> my, see, I'm the kind of preacher, I, I like to preach just in everyday terms. I like to preach just where we live, right? 
And you know as well as I do, when reality of God's promise shows up in your life, not everybody is excited. There is some uh, uh, of some of these people that try to come and fill up your well. The well that you have dug for six years, the well that you have prayed for and worked for and fasted for for 10 years, 20 years, and all of a sudden, the water comes up. All of a sudden, the breakthrough shows up. And somebody comes and tries to fill it. And there's moments when God will allow for somebody to fill it. Now, that's unfair. That's unfair. How many know that's unfair? I don't like that gig. I got a lot of questions for the Father when I get there. <laughs> I'm like, and why? And why not? And why did you let this guy live? Because I was about to kill him. <laughs> Right? I know some of you are so much more spiritual than me. Well, Pastor, you just got to pray and die to the flesh. I'm about to kill his flesh. That's what I'm about to do. Right? I'm going to help that man die to his flesh. <laughs> but I, wanna, I want you to see something here because we're going to launch with this truth here. And the same year, verse 12, and the same year reaped a hundredfold. I want to let you know, some of you are farmers and all that kind of stuff. Ain't nobody reaping a hundredfold. Yeah. 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 In this day, what you got to understand is there was famine upon famine in this day. In this season of this writing, he was in famine after famine. Why in the world would he have a hundredfold return? And the, the answer is because the Lord blessed him. A hundredfold. Let me tell you something. At best, at best, in this day would have been 25-fold. Would have been 30-fold. And in the midst of famine, he goes and opens up this, the, you know, uses dad's wells. Uses dad, goes and says, well, if it worked for the old man, it must work for me. Well, if it worked for the, the, the church, you know, 70 years ago, it must work today. Okay. If it worked 10 years ago, then it must work today. And so what happens is God allows the enemy to come and fill that well in the midst of receiving a hundredfold return. Now, many of us would sit there and we would shun die against the devil and we would fight against the devil, not realizing that it was the Father who allowed that to take place. But why? The Bible didn't say that Isaac sat there and started fighting and got out the, you know, the, the swords and started fighting. The Bible doesn't say that he did that. What it says is it goes all the way to verse 17. And he says, and Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the next valley. I wonder how many of us might be fighting in a place that God has closed up. It's just a question. <laughs> I wonder how many of us, you say, yeah, but it was the devil that did it. It was God that allowed the devil. Let me, let me remind you of something here. The devil is not on the same playing field as Jesus. And many times we think that the devil is so powerful that it's Jesus and the devil is right there. Let me tell you something. The devil is way down here. You want to know who's right here? We are. We are. The Bible says nothing about Satan being uh, seated in heavenly places next to the Father. But it says, it says a whole lot about you and I being seated in heavenly places right there. Now, if you look to your left and you see Jesus, and you look to your left and you see the Father, let me ask you a question. Are they nervous about your situation? Are they shaking in their boots? Are they talking like, don't let him hear that, but... What are we going to do? <laughs> How are we going to get through this? And we didn't expect that to happen from the devil. And they'd be up there going, I knew you were going to do that one. Watch this. Isaac didn't fight. He didn't argue. He probably mumbled under his breath a little bit. 
I don't know what that was about, God, but you be pulling some kind of fast one on me. I don't like what you're doing up there. You know what you're doing. Are you awake up there? But he went to the next valley, and he did something that many people in today's world refuse to do. Because we are addicted to fighting. And if you don't believe me, let me just bring up two words. Trump. Obama. All of a sudden, we all got thoughts now, don't we? Let me bring up other words. Georgia Bulldogs. <laughs> Alabama Crimson Tide. <laughs> now let's go back to my world, Michigan Wolverines. And Ohio State Jerk Eyes. <laughs> you see, we are addicted. I want you to think about this. We are addicted to that drama. Yeah. Aren't we? And we're all experts on social media. But in verse 17, it says, so Isaac moved away from there and camped in the valley. And then Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug by his father. I want you to get this, this moment for a minute. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father, which the Philistines had stopped up uh, after Abraham died. And he gave them the same names his father had given them. Now he's trying, I want you to get this picture, repeating what past moves of God were. Repeating what past moves of God were. I just want to let you know, God loves to bring in stuff from the past, but he's not looking for VC2 to repeat what other people have done in this area. <clears throat> he's not looking for repeat. He's looking for new. Are you okay with that today? And so what happens is, in verse 19, <clears throat> Isaac's uh, servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there, which everybody would be like, wow, this is so cool. There's great worship here, man. People are being fed. There's refreshing. There's wonderful things going on. But yet, something has happened. The herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, in verse 20, the water is ours. So he named the well Essek. Because they disputed. Essek actually means contention. I'm going somewhere if you're, if you're, if you're wondering. We're going to go somewhere. Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named a Sitna, which means strife. So now we got two wells that he dug, and one of them he labeled contention, and one of them he labeled strife. They did all the work. And the people come and say, this is ours. Help us, Jesus. Now, how many of us would be so spiritual, we'd be like Isaac? Oh, yeah, just have it. Contention, strife, we're moving on. I think by the third well, some of us would be like, all right, I'm about to fight. <laughs> it is on. You got your shovel? You got, well, come on, we're going to bash some heads. I mean, think <laughs> about this for a moment. Reality has set in. Think, come on now. Yeah. 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 Now, what I want you to understand God never forgot the promise that he gave his dad. But I want to let you know something. God didn't want him to have the fulfillment of the promise through what used to be. So we're going to let this one be filled up. We're going to let this one be taken from you. Most of us would think, man, maybe parent God lied. Maybe I'd heard the promise wrong. Maybe he isn't going to bless me like he told, his da told my dad. Hey, oh. Maybe I heard him wrong. Maybe, let me just go to our, maybe he isn't going to bless me in my business. Maybe I heard him wrong. Maybe he isn't going to save my kids and bring them back to the kingdom. Because when the well started opening up and you started seeing your kids come alive again and even one conversation about Jesus and you're doing j spiritual jumping jacks in the living room, you're like, yeah, don't let them see it. Wow! And then all of a sudden, the next day, they go out and get hammered again. You feel like, maybe I miss God. You see the 
There's something more that the Father is wanting to teach us as a church, as people, and as individuals. He said, man, that well is, we're going to label that one contention. We're going to label that, with, that one strife. And we're going to move on and we're going to dig some more. You know, back home we had, we leased this bowling alley bar, which seems to be the common, you know, funeral homes, <laughs> bowling alleys, bars. We're like, God, just give us the dirtiest, filthiest buildings <laughs> in the city. If you can renovate people, we can renovate a building, you know what I mean? And so, and during this whole three-year court battle, there was three units in the back of our building that was promised to us. And this guy, this owner, in fact, his license plate said lawsuit. You know you're in trouble if your license plate says lawsuit. And so... There were several times when I wanted to go and fight, because I'm a fighter, right? I may be small, but dynamite comes in small packages, and I'll explode all over you. You know what I mean? So I wanted to fight. And I remember the Lord said, those three units right there do not make or break what I'm going to do in and through cross current. And I had to release that and be like, well, we'll just call that contention. We had to just call that contention. And we had, to, we had to walk from it. You say, well, that's no big deal. Yeah, it is. Because there's times when you say, that is mine. That was promised to me. And we can fight so hard to make the promise come alive that we miss how God actually wants to birth something in your life. God never... I'm telling you, let me tell you something. He never wants to birth his promise out of contention and strife. His birthing process in your life personally and over this church will not be about the loud calling out the devil and fighting it down and all that stuff. It will be birthed out of peace. Be birthed out of peace. So the more you rest in the promise of what God has spoken over your life regarding your kids, the less you'll try to hold up a King James Bible in front of them and try to force feed them the word. Your kids are not coming back to the kingdom out of contention and strife by you. Is this okay? And so what they had to do is they dug and these guys come and steal their water. He enables it contention and strife. <laughs> I just I have a couple of questions. I have a couple of questions. How many of us are, are digging? And we're we're trying to bring this life in a place that God has allowed to close. It doesn't mean he, did, he forgot about the promise. It doesn't mean he's saying, okay, well, this is closed, so the promise is dead. Uh-uh-uh. It's the fact that God wants to bring the promise somewhere else. He wants to bring it in another avenue. You might not be the great spiritual wonder of the world that brings it to pass. You might actually be at a place where you feel like this is never going to come to pass. And God's like, finally, I got you the place where I can bring the promise alive now. Because <laughs> if your son maybe came back to the Lord and you're at that place of contention and strife, you'd be like, I told you for years, it's about time, rather than the celebration of the father when the prodigal returns home. <laughs> See, there's a difference. I mean, come on. I've never forgot my father in heaven to forget a promise. I've forgotten some promises because when you go through hell, you're like, I just want to survive. <laughs> you're batting down the hatches. Don't let me tip over. Don't let me die. And God's like, this is all part of the process, son. 
Because I want you to realize something. Because it's something that the enemy did not realize. Let's go back to that Genesis chapter uh, 26, verse 12. Because the Lord blessed him. Because the Lord blessed him. Do you know what the enemy is after? <clears throat> He's not after your peace. He's not after any particular fruit of your life. What he is after is the source. And where the confusion comes in, and we forget this too, is the source wasn't even in the wells. The reason he had a hundredfold return in a famine day wasn't because of the well. It was because of the Lord. The reason why you made it through a famine time when you got laid off from work is not because you're anything great. It's because you kept your eyes on the Lord and the Lord blessed you through a famine season. But the enemy is so dumb at times because he goes after the well thinking, I'm going after the source of this dude. I'm going after the source of these people. And God's in heaven going, oh, man, what idiots. He does that in a fatherly kind of love. But he's like, they missing it. They is missing it. He said, they think it's all about that well. He says, when I allow these three wells to close in, all I'm doing is trying to get Isaac to see that the legacy of hope is not in the well. It's in me. It's in me. So we had a, our church years ago, we had a, we moved into this 90,000 square foot building about 1,100, 1,200 people coming regularly. We had a $2.1 million budget. I mean, we had the largest influence in the city. We had a youth group of about 250 kids, and it was like rocking and killing, and it was all that stuff, and God cut it at the knees in every facet because we made it about the well. Let me say it one more time. He made, we made it about the well. And when God closed that well up or allowed that well to be closed up and we lost our 90,000 square foot building and the budget went from $2.1 million to 250000 and we went from 27 staff to 14 to four paid, and that's an if. Five volunteer pastors who work about a full-time situation without getting paid. We've learned that it's not about the well. It's not about the well. It's about the Lord. We are more blessed today than what we were back then. We have less money. We have less people. Now our church has grown since then. Our influence has grown a little bit more. But, the, but we were more blessed today because it's not about the well. I was telling a pastor, I said, you know, God could fry this building this week. And we would have all 400 people move on down the road. And we would have just as much glory, just as much worship, just as much reaching people as what we do here. Because it's not about the well. It's not about the well. And the reason why moves of God and churches become museums is because it's about the well. It's not about the Lord. I want to tell you something. I want to remind you. This was in a famine season. We don't know famine in this earth like they know famine in this season. This was famine upon famine. And he goes and he puts a crop out and a hundredfold return shows up in the midst of that. 
so much that the enemy becomes envious. You see, when you make it about the Lord, when the response or the, 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 the breakthrough actually happens or the promise comes alive, your attention is still on the Lord. We are here today and blessed today, not because we have a new building, not because we have a new place, but because it's the Father who is blessed. And I want to tell you something, church. The reason why I bring this message to you is because there are suddenlies coming your way. One in particular, I know that, that, you know, you know, years ago, think about this, three or four years ago, your pastor and I were disconnected for about 20, 18 years. Who's counting? You were just ignoring me for a long time. That well was closed. It was. But we have reopened another well. Suddenlies of relationship. Suddenlies. And my, my question to you is, when God brings a suddenly into your life, when God brings a suddenly into this church's life, what are we going to do? Because the reality and the idea of something are two totally different things. And so my question is, because this is one of the things, as we were growing, as we were moving forward as a church, the Lord began to show me, because we were praying, and we were fasting, and we were digging these wells at church, because I want to tell you, when your pastor Melinda showed up at our church years ago, I was somewhere else, but you, she showed up at our church years ago, and you could barely hear anybody worshiping. Now, we had your pastor as a worship leader back in our day. So our church knew how to worship, we knew how to praise, but hell went through our church. Are you okay with that for a little bit? We went through stuff, and we lost our voice in praise. Because it was about the well. I can't praise you anymore because we've lost people. Really? I can't praise you anymore because the budget went down. Really? I can't praise you anymore because people betrayed me. Really? I look back and I say, how stupid were we? We got to that place in the beginning because we praised him, because we honored him, because we blessed him. So now that the Father allowed some wells to be filled up, I can't praise him now? We can't worship him now? We can't serve him with all of our hearts? But I can tell you what's happened now is we have on purpose dug some wells in our church where the people come hungry again. The first time I took over as a senior pastor almost 10 years ago, I told the church the next day, hey, church, guess what? We had two people get saved, and they looked at me like, Now I tell them, guess what? We had somebody go from death to life last week, and they celebrate like there was no tomorrow. Amen. Why is that? Because we've dug the well again. We didn't redig the well of what it used to be. We didn't want that water anymore. We didn't want the contention. We didn't want the strife. We wanted a new well, so we began to dug. And there were moments, there were moments, church, where we heard the water moving in the well. And we had been digging for years. And I'm like, God, why can't we get there? I know there's more. I know there's a greater flow. I know there's something awesome down there. I can hear it. And the picture that the Lord gave me was this big boulder. And he goes, that's not to be moved by you alone. He's like, where are the people? That are going to get dirty and get down into the well with you and lift this thing up. I said, why don't you do it? He goes, mm-mm. I put it in you to move it. He goes, what I have is under the rock. Come on, somebody. And you want that. And I want that for you. He said, where are the people? So I started calling the staff. I started calling the leaders. Started telling some people, I can't do this. My hands are bloodied. I'm, you know, burning the candle at both ends. 
and I feel like I'm at my end. Not as far as giving up. I only asked God one time through that whole hellish experience, can I quit? <laughs> can I quit? Answer was no. We never had that conversation again. <laughs> but you know what? Going through that hell, my, there was something in my heart that says, if I got to go through this, I want to see what's on the other side. So I'm going to weather this thing, and I'm going through it. And I'm so glad I did. I said, shut up. This is good. <laughs> this is good. But what's amazing is going down into that well, one by one, I begin to see people. And it wasn't a physical thing. It was hearts connecting. It was people begin to pray at a greater level. People begin to take ownership at a greater level. People begin to realize that this isn't just a church I attend. This is my church where I'm called. People begin to take a responsibility like they never had before, and they begin to reach down. And I begin to hear conversations like, Pastor, I was up in the middle of the night praying, help and move this rock. Pastor, we're fasting. Pastor, the Lord told me that I can't just give my tithe anymore, that I've got to start really investing more financially. And he said, Pastor, I don't even have it. That's all right. I said, he'll provide seed to the sower. If he's told you to do it, he'll make that happen. And what happens is I saw more and more and more and more and more hands begin to lift this big boulder up. And the more we lifted up, the more we heard the sound. The more we heard the sound, you say, what is it? Is it something in the spirit? Yeah, it's by faith, but let me just give you more practical. We saw more people begin to get saved. Yeah, yeah. We saw more celebration. Yeah. We heard more voices of praise. Yeah. We heard more voices of worship. We saw our youth group go from four people. Think about that. From 275 to four, and three of them were the pastor's kids. <laughs> no lie. She's got four or five boys, and three of them were hers. I'm like, you just tripled the youth ministry. Nice job. <laughs> <clears throat> now we got 65 kids coming regularly, and we're building a youth center for the community. I don't say that because we're anything, because that's the well. The source is the father. And more and more people begin to lift. More of a, and one day I'm sitting there, and I play bass on Sunday mornings. I like to rock out, and we're an hour from Motown, and we like to kill it, you know? And so we're like, all of a sudden, I, I was sitting there playing bass, and I started tearing up. And the Lord says, take out your ears, because we have these in-ears. He said, take out your ears. I said, okay, I did. And I heard our church. Come on. Jesus. I heard our church. And it wasn't like just this bad sound. It was they believed what they were singing. Yeah. They, they, they believed it. And it wasn't just me or a few people hearing. Come on, Lord. They all heard it. And it was like it, it, instantly this rock, this boulder comes shooting out of the well. <laughs> and I can't stop them. I can't shut them up. I can't shut them up. And there's three different people. I don't know what time I'm at. I'm sorry. Am I? Good. We'll be here till two. And there's three different people that the Lord began to challenge me with. With this well digging. And first of all, I want you to know that, that wells back in the day, sometimes we think of this little circle and, you know, and some of them were like this. But these ancient wells were sometimes 20 to 30 feet wide. What does that tell you? They planned on legacy. They didn't just dig for themselves. It wasn't like, well, I just need enough for my family. No, no, they, they did enough for everybody. Yeah. They dug for others. They dug for the next gen. When you trace back some of these wells and you look at what's happening now and over the years, the amount of people that journeyed in the 1400s and the 1200s, they journeyed to see where these wells were because there was something significant 
about legacy. And now they say over, over one of these wells or all of them, I don't know, there's a gigantic commerce place, a place where business is done. And it's actually a very wealthy place. There's three different people that the Lord began to challenge me with at home. There's a group of people that have been digging for a long time. And their shovel's a little tattered and a little worn, a little broken. And these are the people that have been jabbing at the rocks. Jabbing at the boulders. Some have done it with a great heart. With an attitude of God, thank you for the ability to at least dig. And then there's a group of people that have been doing this thing and haven't realized it, but in their hearts have gone to wish other people would help. They've gone to an attitude. I'm not saying here. I'm saying these are challenges back home, so don't get mad at me. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've been digging for a long time. I wish they would get on board. And it sounds spiritual because you want people to help, but it's almost turned into an attitude. And believe me, I have held that shovel before. And then there's a group of people that you're holding a shovel. Still got the sticker on it. <laughs> right out the store. And you're thinking, it's insignificant what I have to offer. Insignificant what I have to give and what could, could I add and I want to tell you today, it doesn't matter the size of your shovel, it matters the size of your heart. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who feel insignificant, you know, I don't have anything to offer, and you know, and you have a new shovel, there's two questions I have for you. One, will you get in the well and just start chopping away? Because here's what I know, you can think you have this. You can think you have this size of shovel, but when your heart is in alignment with the Father, He sees you as having this shovel. And it's a lot more significant than what you give yourself credit for. I'm going to close with this. He moved, verse 22. He moved on from there and dug another well. And no one quarreled over it, which is probably a good sign that you're in the sweet spot. Are we okay with that? And no one quarreled over it, which is probably a good sign you're in the sweet spot. Do you know how we knew we were in the right place and the well, the right well has been dug at our church? Although we have time to time where somebody of an attitude shows up, it's not every week anymore. It may be once every three years that we have to deal with a church issue. Church discipline, church issues, that's just part of family. Are you okay with that today? But there is such a peace over our church and over our people. There is such a unified heart over our church and over our people. And the reason is, is because people are choosing to pick up a shovel, no matter how big or small they think it is, and how insignificant or significant they think it is. And there's a unified move. There's a unified heart. As I was preparing, I, I think about this, and I heard this, that <clears throat> there's no shiny shovels in kingdom business. If your shovel is shiny, eh, you wonder what you're doing. You can even be doing this. 
Hallelujah. But yet your shiny, your shovel is shiny. We can attend every week, and I think it's awesome because I think the church ought to be together. Eight to the men and women, for those that get offended. Attend every week and still have a shiny shovel. Because a shovel and digging is not about the instrument, it's about the heart. All I want to ask today is, who is willing to grab a shovel? And your pastor doesn't give me messages to share. So anything that's said this week <laughs> is pretty much something that the Lord has given Pastor Marlene, myself, or your pastor. I mean, we're not setting you up for anything. But I just wonder. Anybody maybe need a change of heart, and you've been digging, you've been working, and you've been fall into the category maybe of just complaining and frustrated with a bunch of people and angry and then when they finally do grab a shovel you're like it's about time because that's not going to dig the well that's not going to move the rock I wonder how many has just got the shovel and it, it's just too shiny I play softball and I play baseball my whole life and football and I always wanted the dirtiest uniform I wanted dirt on me my wife still is like, do you always got to come home this dirty? You're 46 years old now. <laughs> and it's like that in the kingdom. I want to be, be dirty. I don't want to have a shiny shovel. I want to have a shovel that's tattered and broke apart. I want something that has been utilized. When I get to heaven, I stand before the Father. I don't want to be like, yeah, I still have something left in the tank, Father. I want a shovel that helps dig a well for the kingdom. God didn't forget about his legacy promise. He didn't forget. In fact, he goes on to say that the same promise that he gave Abraham, he's given to Isaac. God didn't forget. He just wanted Isaac to remember that it's not about the well, son. It's about the source, and that's me, and that's me.